No. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. I thought maybe nobody would be here. We're sort of out on New River and our house was buffeted by these amazing winds all night long. I thought, oh, the trees will be down, all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff. So, so you guys are hardy people, which is <coughs> what I would expect in your side. <laughs> Uh, again, my name is Nancy. Um, I, I, for the last 30 years, been at East Coast State University, uh, where I uh, was in the um, in the Natural Resources College and in the Watershed Sciences Department. And uh, so I, I was a state water quality extension specialist, and I taught some classes. And one of the classes I taught was uh, was an oddball one. It was oceanography <laughs> in the middle of Utah, uh, but it was a uh, non-majors class. And uh, I took that I took that class really seriously because there was all these students that never had had a science class in their life. And with oceanography, it's a chance to teach people how the world works is the way I view it, you know, because so many things are informed by our oceans. And so, um, so one of the other day asked me to or to this um, volunteered me to give a talk, and I said, well, "What do you want it to be about?" And she said, "Oceanography." <laughs> I thought, well, I'll do it out a semester. <laughs> so I've been whittling it down, and I'm not sure I got it whittled down quite as far enough. So we're going to sort of go a little lightly over the surface on some things, I think. But that's probably good. I thought we would talk, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about water movements in the ocean. And I think a lot of us stand on the beach and look out and see the waves, but we're not totally sure. Some, some of you are sure how to fish, and so you got a much better feel for that, or you're going to cruises or whatever. But um, so we're going to talk about how water moves across the oceans and the implications of that, you know, what that means to us. And mostly just a few examples. So I thought I'd start with a little show and tell here. You guys have seen this before, I'm sure. I found this one on the beach just in, at, um, near Newport um, in 1992, and um, which is cool. It's back when you could still find these. Um, where did it come from? Yeah. Did it come from Brazil? Yeah. In fact, it was in all of the talks I ever took about Brazil, uh, which is, uh, and I, at the time, I was, what I know, I was a dumb kid, but, um, and, and just learning that this thing had gone all the way across the ocean from a Japanese fishing net that had broken free from. Uh, just inspired me to learn more and more about it. So I'm hoping that we can kind of, if you've got questions, let me know. So we'll just go kind of uh, work our way through this and, and see how it goes. So Ocean in Motion, which is mostly the title because it, it sounds good. <laughs> and now, do you want to unfreeze it? <laughs> this is all right, right. everybody I pray. pray. <laughs> <laughs> I check specialist because I'm not the one. Yeah, and I don't know very much. Okay. Let this thing rest for a minute and it should it to the side. We've got Zoom involved, and so that always gets kind of funky also. Let me keep talking while we get this going. Christine, can you imagine what's going on here? <laughs> we all got here early, so this doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, um, oh, just click on it. Okay. So, if you're standing at the beach and you're thinking about movement in the ocean, I think the waves are the obvious, you know, thing to notice, especially recently, you know, but you know, a very obvious feature of the ocean. And and uh, and I'm not going to talk about them very much because um, I'm just going to stand up here because I need the, the left button. The left button. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other than just just very briefly, uh, and then but, but we have a lot of different kinds of waves in the ocean, and we'll just kind of flip over those real quickly. And I want to talk about currents, which is masses of water that are moving across the ocean. And we have localized currents, we have gyres or eddies, and, and, and all sorts of interesting movement. We have movement in the surface and towards the bottom of the ocean. And there's no time to talk about all of this, so I'm going to sort of hit some highlights and, and see where that, where that takes us. Um, see, the, um, just a couple of slides about waves and just what I call wind waves. So wind waves are caused by 
the friction of wind over the over the ocean during storm, big storm, kind of like what we're having here. And you know, because you live live here, that a few days after we get a big blow like this or a big storm, we'll get some really big waves. And because the waves are the, are the, the waves are formed out where the, where the storms are, and the the waves just head out from that center in all directions. But the ones that are heading towards us kind of sort themselves out, so they start kind of aligning, and you end up with uh, what's called swell, which I sure is not a new term to most of you. And um, and these waves are not they, they don't interact with the the ocean floor. They don't do much of anything other than just transfer pure energy across the, across the surface. In this case, across the surface between the uh, the air and the top of the water. And so you get this <coughs> typical wave motion, and the only water that's moving underneath or that, that, that's involved with the wave itself are these weird little circular orbits. And I thought I had a slide for this, but. I, I don't want to. Can I use the arrows still? Uh oh. Use the. How do I go backwards? Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> <that's all right. laughs> no. Don't don't touch. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and then the left is to go forward again. Okay. Yeah. The um. You want to go back? I'm okay. Oh, I lost the slide. Let me go back. I apologize. This is the kind of thing that makes me crazy. Okay. Oh, no, forward. Forward. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So so these little circles are supposed to be the motion of the water molecules. They go under a wave. So a wave goes over the surface, and the only water that's actually moving is this little orbit of, of water molecules underneath the crest of the wave as it, as it travels past. And you may have experienced this if you've gone swimming in the in the ocean. You sort of feel like you're in a washing machine, and you're going back and forth. And that is exactly what's happening. So these these little orbits cause another little orbit. So here's the surface, another little orbit that starts right below that from the one above it, and another little one below that, and a smaller and smaller motion until you get to a depth that's about half the total wavelength of the of the wind wave. And um and that that's the that's the motion <laughs> of the ocean associated with these large swells and waves out in the out in the middle of the ocean. When it gets to the shore is when it starts, all this motion starts interacting with water, with the, with the bottom of the ocean. It slows things down. They, we're not going to go into all of that other than to say that, that you get these orbits kind of overtake themselves and the wave breaks. And that is when you have water moving in, a, in the same direction as the wave. And the only time these kind of waves that that happens. And so it's still a lot of energy, but up to that point, it's just kind of pure energy. And then it's, it's the, the mass of the water being pushed by that energy. So that's wind waves. We also have, what are the other kinds of waves? Can you think of them? Tsunamis, <laughs> which uh, go, these are going maybe 10 miles an hour, 510. Tsunamis traveling maybe 500 miles per hour, <clears throat> caused by a completely different, as you know, disruption because we live with this here. Um, and um, so very, very fast, and so half the wavelength is, um, is, is, uh, is hundreds of miles. And so these tsunamis, almost always, this, this circular pattern is dragging on the bottom of the ocean. So they're hard to predict, they're turning around because they're being attracted by being dragged on the bottom of the ocean. All sorts of stuff going on with tsunamis. And it's a talk in and of itself, and I'm not going to go into it. And then what's the third kind of wave that we have here? Tide. Tide. Tide wave. And tides um, are constrained waves. Wavelength is half the distance around the Earth. And, yeah, but it still has that same wave function. And again, we're not going to talk about it right now, but it's certainly a way that water is moving. But this, the, the waves that we see on shore, these wind waves as they break, and you know, fabulous displays that we see. Um, the impacts again are mostly where wave energy has has hit something, the coast or a, a seawall or a, a boat or something like that. And so you get a, you get shoreline effects and you get movement of sediment and those sorts of things. And I'm done talking about one thing. <laughs> you got any quick questions? <laughs> it's like it's a talk in and of itself. What is TSM? Say again? Abbreviation TSM. 
It was on a previous slide. Tsunami, maybe? Oh, I bet I, I, I bet I, um, I bet it was a typo. So it's to, <laughs> I think it's supposed to be meters per second. Does that make sense? I'm afraid to go backwards. <laughs> yes. So in a in a wind wave, before it's influenced by the shore. Uh -huh. Um, it's just the moving. water isn't moving, but but these bubbles are well, moving. it's not bubbles, it's water molecules. If you can see individual molecules, they're moving, okay. but they're just moving in a on the surface. The diameter of those half the wavelength, so I think it matters, but you know, and then the one below that is smaller and smaller, and so it just goes down. Um, and again, you know, when I swim in the ocean, it feels like you're sort of in this in this washing, washing machine. <laughs> Well, it, it's not really because it's um, it's got such a huge if, if it had a hugely deep deep ocean it might but the way we experience it is sort of a wall of water because it's always interacting with the bottom and always sort of ready to break and so it's a very different kind of expression of the wave energy but it still is transporting energy mostly across the ocean. Okay, so I thought what I'd do is focus mostly on ocean currents because um, you know we don't see them as much, and it's, uh, and and they inform everything on Earth. You know they're they're involved in transporting all sorts of things across huge distances and little distances, and and um, bi the biology of the ocean is absolutely um, dependent on currents for things, there's other, you know, a, lot, uh, a lot of other, other issues that we'll talk on. So what we have, what I'm going to talk about today are what we call surface currents, which are the currents that extend down maybe 100, 200 meters down into the ocean. Does anybody know how deep the ocean is? It's dark. It's yeah. deep and dark. <laughs> <laughs> on the average, 4,500 meters, 4,600 meters, okay, two and a half, two point seven miles, on average, not counting the deep areas. And so um, there's a lot of water down there that's not being not moving in these surface currents. And and those and that's the deep ocean. We're gonna talk about how water moves in the deep ocean and and how water gets from one part to the other. Vertical movement. And then a lot of the other movements, a lot of the near shore stuff, I don't really have time to get into all of that. So we'll just uh, we'll get that far. Okay, <laughs> see how that goes. And I'm just mostly going to sort of show you how this works and then um, show you a couple of examples of why we care, what the impacts might be. So surface currents are formed by wind also. But in this case, it's, it's continuous wind that is actually pushing the water. So the water is moving, not just energy transfer. And, um, oh great, this thing is covering half of my presentation. Anyway, um, the surface, um, the, the water, or excuse me, a regular wind can transfer about 2% of its energy to moving the water forward. And so you can actually create, if you've got a 100 mile an hour wind, you sustain that, you can get a 2 mile an hour um, current on average. And that's just the surface. And then that water, that layer that's moving, will cause the water underneath it to start moving, and that will start moving. The thing to pay and keep in mind is that, um, is there a way to get rid of all the stress? No. Okay. Oh well, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> see, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say let's get it down here because the headers are good. Okay, there we go. Um, so, so the, the the net effect of all of this, and I don't want to, uh, is that we have six main wind patterns on Earth. We have what we call the trade winds. We have the westerlies, and we have the polar easterlies. And we have those major wind bands in the north and in the southern hemisphere. And you may have heard people refer, sometimes meteorologists refer to Hadley cells when they want to get fancy. And Hadley cells are simply the trade winds, this sort of band, or uh, almost a, a sort of tube of winds that are north and south of the equator. And they're very, very predictable. And so when we traveled around with <coughs> sailboats, uh, sailors could trade on them. You know, they would say, this, you can trade on this, it's going to, they're going to be there. Um, then we have another wind band that are the westerlies, and that's where we live. 
Okay, and the westerlies are formed by sort of unstable conditions. And I could love to talk to you about it later, but we won't do that right now. <laughs> but the, the, um, as a result, you get much more sort of frontal weather. You get the weather to the west, right? We look to the west, we don't look to the east where our weather is coming from here. If we were down, uh, down in the southern hemisphere, um, in the westerlies, we would look uh, to the west also. It turns out it's the same. And, and, um, a lot of a lot of uh, big storm systems and a lot of very dynamic behaviors or uh, air movement in the westerlies, and then we have the polar easterlies, which are way up at the poles, as it suggests, and heading again. So big objects moving over the Earth that the Earth is spinning tend to be deflected, and um, just take my word on this. <laughs> uh, deflected to the right. Um, in the northern hemisphere, deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. And they call it the Coriolis effect. And it's um, it's because you've got large objects moving over a large spinning object that the sphere. And so the the, um, the the surface of the Earth, the velocity of the Earth is faster here than here because uh, it's all uh, the whole thing is moving at the, is, is rotating at the same speed. And so, um, and so it results in this kind of apparent deflection. It's not really called a force, it's just a deflection. But it becomes really important in terms of how we perceive the direction or how, uh, how the direction of these currents um, uh, end up and currents and waves over, over our Earth. So we have this kind of strange kind of you know, bent pattern for the steady winds. They're pushing wind all along at, at, a, at a modest rate. <clears throat> and um, and so if you follow this, let's look at the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the trade winds, these purple ones. They're pushing the water from east to west down in the tropics. You know, when you're down at 20 degrees or 15 degrees, you know, you're looking to the east for your winds there or for your weather. And they're pushing the water, and the water's going, going, going. And in most of our oceans, it hits a continent. Okay. And in the northern hemisphere, it moves to the right. It's deflected to the right. There it goes. And until it gets picked up by the westerlies, and then it gets pushed to the from the west to the east until it hits a continent. And it, it turns to the right again. And there, that's it. <laughs> in the south, it's the same thing. It's uh, except now you've got winds coming from the southeast and they're pushing it. And so you've got winds being pushed same direction, but when it hits a continent, it goes to the left. And so now you've got a turn to the left, picked up by the southern westerlies, turn to the left, picked up. And so you've got these systems. And if you can't remember anything else, you just have to remember turn to the right, turn to the left, northern and southern hemisphere. And you've got most of it figured out. <laughs> um, and, and so, I think so. The the end result for these major for the major currents in the in the world, and I apologize that I've lost a lot of content down here. Um, is that um, is that we have five of these large gyres they're called. Okay, and so we are right here on the California coast. We've named all these different currents, California currents, but we're in the North Pacific gyre, and it's going clockwise. And it's picking up this equatorial current, being deflected to the north, heading over to Japan, picking up my globe, my, my float, heading over this way, and about two and a half <laughs> years later, depositing it over here on the, on the beaches, and then continuing on around. And so it's most of the motion in this ocean, <laughs> the currents and the surface currents, is on the edges of it. You've got another one in the North Atlantic, in the South Pacific, in the South Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean, because India's poking down there. There's, there's only one in that, in that particular part of the ocean. So, um, and then we also have underneath this band, um, what's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And that's down there in the wild 40s, they talk about it, where there's no continents to get in the way, right? Has anybody gone and traveled down to Antarctica and taken a boat over the Great Passage? How was it? Yes. <laughs> a little windy? <laughs> my yeah. This is uh, where some of the largest waves in the world are, of course. And it's also where the, the 
huge current gets generated because it is never deflected by continent. There's no continents there. And so it goes and goes and goes and goes. And it is as deep as the ocean. And it is wide. And it's mixing stuff all the way through the ocean. We'll get back to the implications of that in just a second. But you've got a huge amount of mixing down here in this very deep, huge ocean, carrying 100 times the volume of the of the Amazon. You know, all the, you know, it's, it's huge. And um, <coughs> Um, bigger than any of these others. I want to also, yeah, let's focus on that for a sec. Oops. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I blew it. Let me go back if you want to. If it's just a little twice to remind me what I'm saying. The, um, so, the, the, um, so we've got these surface currents. And the, yeah, sure. But like, yeah, sure. You said that the currents are moving faster at the pole. And at the equator because of the rotation of the earth, that doesn't make sense to me. No, I'm saying that the, the earth is spinning faster because it takes the take a pencil and draw the, the line around the earth at a high latitude up on a pole, the shorter distance. Right. So it's moving so it's slow. Moving slow. It's doing the whole revolution uh, at the same time that the equator is doing the revolution, which is actually even faster. No. The equator's moving. No. Okay, oh, yeah. sorry. Right. 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 Yeah. There are people out there that are supposed to correct me when I do these stupid things. <laughs> 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 That's exactly, no, you're exactly right. I, I just said it wrong. I, I apologize. Yeah, no, that it's, um, the equator is going faster and it is slower as you go to the north and the south. I apologize. So are the currents moving faster at the equator than at the pole? The current is constrained by the movement of the water itself. And so it's mostly just, it's not really speeding up. But the deflection is caused by the the, the, the different movements of the of the water relative to the movement of the. So one more question. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about this whole time. Well, I didn't As opposed to waves, is a current moving water, or is it energy moving through water? It's, yeah, a current. Good question. And the current again is a mass of water. It's moving in one direction. Okay, it's just a mass of water. And it carries with it whatever properties it has with it, temperature, solidity, all those sorts of things. Whereas the, the, the wave is, is energy with a little bit of weird movement and transferring that energy. So in a minute, we're going to talk about piling up water <laughs> at the wind. So the wind's doing all sorts of different things to water. But in this case, it's sort of starting this current that's kind of moving along. And so I, I didn't know any of this stuff when I was a kid growing up in Nebraska. I never thought about it at all. And the only people I think that really thought about it were the early sailors and folks that were out there trying to do things. And so we had observations by sailors over the years of, of the currents. And so people had a pretty good feel, especially having well um, studied or well traveled parts of our globe, uh, that there were currents and that they were doing different things, but they weren't well understood. The um, but we do have those observations. We also increasingly had observations of objects floating in those currents. And so things like, you know, the fish float, but also these days trash, but also bio uh, biological organisms, you know, all the plankton and, and um, you know, um, jelly, sea jellies and things like that are being moved uh, by the currents. We have um, the distribution of um, we can look at, at the distribution of water with different properties, if you can figure out how to measure that. I'll get to that in just a sec. You can do direct measurements by putting buoys or electronic or, or sub, submerging buoys and measuring them electronically, going at some signal. That's how we know when a, 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 we can precisely say when a, for example, tsunami is coming our way. Just we, can, we can measure you know, a little bit of movement on the surface of that. But what has really, really been a game changer is satellites. Satellites are, are what allowed us to look at the Earth from a distance. And so uh, all of a sudden you could see that it wasn't just that ocean and this ocean and this shoreline and that shoreline. It was an integrated system. Some people call it a heat engine. It was one huge system. And you could start seeing how these things really interacted with each other. And so a lot of the some of the pictures I'll show you are satellite pictures, which are pretty cool, I think. So let's go back to Sailor. Do you remember what Benjamin Franklin's um, position was in the new government in the United States? One of the many hats he wore. Bass. 
He was the ambassador of France, was over there partying and carrying on. Um, he was uh, he was our first postmaster general. He was in charge of getting the mail delivered on time. And being the polyglot that he was, he um, he wanted to. He, he had heard from sailors that there was a lot. They got into this fast current in the Atlantic Ocean, and he thought, well, you know, we ought to be able to, you know, figure out what's going on there and take advantage of that. His thinking was that um, you could take this fast current from our new country to Europe, get the mail there a little earlier, and avoid it coming back and um, not get delayed by pushing against a fast turn. And so um, he collected all sorts of data from all sailors that he was able to talk with and created this first very detailed map of what we now call the Gulf Stream. And, and he called it a river in the sea and calculated its, 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 its velocity as something like four miles per hour, <clears throat> flipping along for a, for a, um, for a current. Um, and again, it carries more water than all the old rivers in the ocean, uh, on the continents, excuse me, because it, 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 um, it's very narrow and deep near uh, Florida. It gets water and more shallow as it goes across, across the ocean. <laughs> but for his purposes, he wanted to know how you could, how you could get the mail delivered in time. Yeah. And um, uh, which was uh, actually a remarkable achievement, one of his many. Um, and then we had other ways of looking at things floating across the ocean. This is when we were all just in college or youngsters. Um, in 1992, there was a, a big shipment of one of those big container ships of, um, of rubber duckies <laughs> that was going from China to the United States. Do you guys remember this when it happened? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and um, and uh, it, they, they spilled. There was a big storm and a bunch of them spilled into the ocean. So all of a sudden we've got an ocean full of little rubber duckies. And um, there was a, an enterprising oceanographer that looked at this situation. Here's, here's where the, the boat went, here's where it spilled, January 1992. We thought, you know, I bet we could learn something if we could figure out where people are finding them. It was just genius to do this, I think. So he um, says, so huge citizen science project is really what it was. And so he uh, got the word out. We didn't have an internet, but he was able to use you know, bulletin boards or whatever, and um, and mapped where people found these rubber duckies uh, as they as they made land. And so here's the spill in 1992. Um, in 1995, they or, or no, in 1992, uh, a little later in the year, about a year later, they found them off the coast of Alaska. By um, they found them in Tacoma, 1996. They found them in Australia. Uh, beyond that, not a lot of movement across the the, um, the equator, but they did get some that went across there, which is is, is unusual. They even found them in the Atlantic Ocean. And um, this is 2000, 2003, 2007. They found some in um, in uh, the British Isles, which is just kind of amazing, you know. And so he mapped all of this, and it gave people a real sense that you've got this stuff happening that is predictable, but um, not what it would, you would think, you know, if you're just thinking about going across the ocean. Um, the other objects that um, have spilled off of container ships, I remember the Nike tennis shoe ones. Did you guys remember that? That they were like a big deal, and everybody wanted Nike. And they had, they had packaged them so that Left shoes were in one box and right <laughs> shoes were in another box. <laughs> so when they spilled, um, when they spilled, um, there was no internet, nobody knew how to reach these things, but somebody would say, Yeah, I've got a male left shoe size 11, <laughs> right shoe. And there were these huge networks that formed, you know, again on bullet boards and things where people tried to get a complete set because Nikes weren't a lot of demand and other things, but in, in, in effect, We've been able to, to serendipitously find a whole lot of, of information just by these kinds of things happening. The, um, another thing that currents carry is heat. Water absorbs heat, water, um, and, and, you know, it's, uh, and as the water moves, it takes the heat that it has absorbed with it. Okay? And so this is a thermal image, one of those satellite images I was telling you about, where you can see this better than, uh, I, I love this image. So here we've got, here we've got where we are out here, 
and we've got the orange is warm, okay, and then yellow, and then green is cooler, and then very cold water is the blue, and the coldest water is the purple, okay. And you can see that the heat is just not distributed evenly across that term. The sun is mostly hitting at the equator, up in, you know, plus or minus 20, 20 half degrees. And so it's, um, most of it is here, but the heat, and we've known this for a long time, the Earth is releasing more heat north and south of that than you can explain just by the sun. And it's because this heat is being moved by the currents and by the winds to different places. And so here's this heat intense along the equator, and here's the Pacific gyre, and you can see it, the heat sort of moving over here on the west side of the gyre and cooling off as it gets up into the cooler climates, coming back down to bring us that nice cool northwest summer that we have, <laughs> and then picking up that again down here in the warm tropics. Same thing in the South Pacific, um, same thing in the South Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean. And if you look over here, a strange thing happens. Um, and that is that this gyre in the South Atlantic runs into the continent, but it runs into Brazil, which is poking out like a little, like an arrow out there. And the, um, and it deflects some of it. So we've got, we've got, here's, here's, here's that Southern current that's going around uh, counterclockwise, hits Brazil. Some of it goes the way it's supposed to go, left, because it's the deflection in the southern hemisphere, but some of it gets shunted to the north and actually crosses the equator, which is really the only place that happens in this in surface current, and it joins this other current, and so it's subsidizing the North Atlantic current, and, um, and that's one of the reasons that the Gulf Stream is so powerful because it's subsidized from water and the heat energy and everything from the south. Which, um, and so here you can see the Gulf Stream coming up and kind of petering out as it goes out into, or temperature anyway, as it goes out into the North Atlantic. Okay. Um, the, um, so that's some of the horizontal movement in the, in the shallow parts of our, of our, um, of our oceans by currents. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, is that satellite picture from the uh, extension? It was 2006, oh, and that was a, they had combined them. I think it was for a whole year. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, that was a that that was was average. It used, um, necessarily. Not necessarily. There, there's some seasonal change, and things shift north and south a little bit, the question. But, but this was just sort of the average on that particular image. Um, this, we're simplifying to this one smoothly, as I'm sure you can make <laughs> which helps me anyway. <laughs> so, um, so I want to talk about the, what happens. You know, all of this water is moving around on the surface. Is nothing happening down below? Is the water just sitting there? It's not being moved by the wind, right? The wind aren't involved in this. Um, they can't reach the water below the surface. And so what tends to move the uh, water vertically, up or down, is masses of water that are either converging on each other or are diverging away from each other. So when they are converging, when currents are coming together of any couple of different means, what happens is you get too much water in one place and the water is forced down by gravity. And so it sinks. And it sinks until it reaches some place down in the ocean that has the same density that it has. And so, do you know what I mean by density of water? It's the mass of the water in, in the unit volume, or the mass of anything in the unit volume. And so, what increases the density of water is to heat up, the, or to cool off the water. Excuse me. The cold water is more dense than warm water, and making it saltier. The salty water is more dense than than um, in fresh water, and, there, and there's a couple of other other means, but those are the two real reasons that that the density will change. So here we have an idealized gyre, one of these gyres. Let's call it the North Atlantic gyre, and continent and the continent. And here we've got the star scooting around, and it's pushing things to the right, um, because that's what you do when you're in the northern hemisphere. And it's sort of mounding up water, 
in the center of these gyres. And so you get areas uh, where the water actually is physically going down. We'll talk about the implications of that in a minute. Doing the same thing on the end of the southern gyres. But here between these two, this is the equatorial currents, and the south, south of the equator is pushing water to the left. North of the equator, pushing water to the right. And so you're pushing these big masses apart. That water ends up having to be replaced by something else, and it gets replaced by deep water. And so you have downwelling and you have upwelling happening when these, when these big masses of water are, are moving um, relative to each other, coming towards each other, and moving away. The, um, I don't think this is going to be very helpful. So convergence of, 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 of uh, currents causes downwelling, which is the term we use. And uh, there's, there's kind of a few places in the oceans where that happens. One is in the North Atlantic, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And one is in the center of gyres, we was mentioning that too. And then the other is along the coast when you have strong winds. That are going parallel to the coast, and um, if the winds are going to uh, from the, let me make sure I say this right. <laughs> if they're going uh, from the south, they're pushing water towards the coast. And if they're going from the north, the right in, in our part of the world, they're pushing water away from the north. And so you have convergence of the of this well of the of the masses of water. With, with southern winds, and you have divergence, the water being replaced by water coming from the north. And we'll get back to that too. So, both, basically, that's where this happens across the oceans. And so, let's look at, um, at these three big currents, or where the currents come together. Here's our Gulf Stream again, okay? Supplemented, hot, fast, real defined current. And it's moving up into the northern Atlantic. And it meets all of these cold currents, lo more localized currents that are formed up in, up in the Arctic and are coming down around Labrador and Greenland. And so you've got this cold water that's hitting this warm water and it cools off sufficiently so that the water um, becomes more dense. Up to that point, it's pretty salty, but it's very, very warm. Do you ever remember how warm the Gulf Stream got last year? I couldn't believe it. It was crazy. Uh, I didn't think that was possible, actually. But it's always been a very warm current. And um, so it cools off enough so that it's cold and salty, and it starts to sink. And some people kind of describe this almost as it sort of pulls some of the other currents with it, kind of like, you know, when you're sleeping at night and your, your, your um, bed spread gets off the side of the bed, it starts pulling the rest of the bed spread off. You can almost think of that. It's sort of, Pulling it along that way. Or pushing it off. <laughs> or pushing it off. No, pushing off. That's a different issue. And that, that's marriage and counseling we're talking about. <laughs> the other um, the other place that we see this happening is in Antarctica, around the waters around Antarctica. And here you've got waters in the Little Sea and waters over here off the coast of Australia, where um, where um, the uh, the waters now. Um, has historically uh, been where ice is formed, we have permanent ice formation. And sea ice is kind of fresh water. What happens is the ice is formed and the salts kind of bleed out of the ice over time. And so the water underneath sea ice is very salty because it's getting this kind of subsidized all the, the, the ice from the frozen seawater. And, um, and so it's very salty and very cold. And so this is the densest water on Earth being formed up in here. Yeah. So does this do the dead zone play into this? Not these, no, no, that's a more localized effect. So let's finish uh, this and we can talk about that later. I wasn't going to talk about this. Yeah, there's so many things going on. <laughs> I had a hard time kind of structuring this talk just because, oh, and this and this and this. <laughs> so I hope this is making some sense. So we're down here now um, creating very cold, very dense water, and it's also sinking. And so it results in this kind of interesting stratification of big blobs of water, big masses of water in the deep parts of our oceans. 
And these graphs always start in the Atlantic because this is sort of what we understand the best. And so I, I took one of those maps and kind of put it on its side so you can sort of see what's going on. So here you've got, this, excuse me, the South Atlantic. Here's Antarctica down here. So you've got the North Atlantic. Here's, um, and so here's where the, the Gulf Stream is creating this downwelling, this current that's, 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 that's diving down. And here's where those very dense waters are being formed in the Atlantic. And so the Gulf Stream is up here, red, nice and warm, cooling off. At some point, it gets cool enough and still pretty salty that it starts to sink and, you know, it heads down. Here's the really dense water, and it would just keep going if it didn't hit the bottom of the ocean. It's very dense, but it spreads out north into the Atlantic. And then you've got some water that's um, called creatively intermediate water. <laughs> These are their names. Um, scientists aren't really great namers. <laughs> My husband worked up in the Arctic and they had, what, where are you? They had Lake L1, L2, L3. <laughs> so poetic. <laughs> but um, anyway, they have, um, uh, and then right here at the equator, you've got this real stratification. And you would think that these would mix a little bit, right? Now, living in Utah all these years, I can't use this. I, didn't ever, I quit using this example in Utah because they um, they are not. Oh shoot, it's gone. I can't show it. Um, this is supposed to be a, a, a cup of coffee with different colored layers where they've added milk. And that was the point of Utah is that a lot of Mormons don't drink any coffee. <laughs> That's what I know what I was talking about. But uh, it was always a good example anywhere else. So. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> we'll just let you keep in charge of this. So you've got thermal or you've got stratification of three different layers. And you've all seen this if you've ever put cream in a cup of coffee or something. And you see how, how it mixes around and you can still see the white and you can still see the, the coffee. And it's because water or liquids of different densities really resist mixing. If a, if you can calculate how much energy it takes, but it really resists mixing. And that's what's happening here. They're different densities and they resist mixing and they retain their properties, which were created at the surface, so the surface properties, for tens, hundreds of years, a long time. Uh, another example is, um, is for those of you that grew up swimming in lakes, warm lakes, not lakes right there. <laughs> and, um, did you want the next yeah, slide? Yeah, would you mind? Yeah. Uh, and if you could push that up, oh, not too far. Okay, you're fired. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh thank you. I see. Can you push that up? There we go. So, um, just have this experience. You jump into a summer lake, and the surface is nice and warm, and you go a little too deep, and what happens? Oh. <laughs> and, you know, I used to think I was imagining it. I didn't know what was going on. But it's an actual stratified lake. And, and during the summer, the lake becomes more and more stratified. So you've got warm water on the top, and you've got cold water on the bottom, which is more dense. And it resists mixing until big winter storms or winds come up, and then it finally mixes. And it's the same principle. You're seeing this happening in the oceans on a much bigger scale and slightly different properties than the water itself. Yeah. yeah. So is that how we have rivers going into oceans and you're having some species yeah. that are salt water yeah, and some that are fresh and they just don't yeah. make it. Yeah, our it estuaries, some of our estuaries are completely informed by that, 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 that process. Yeah. Are there any other questions about this right now before I just wedge on? <laughs> so I've seen the videos like in the uh, down around Cape Horn where you see at the surface, it's almost like a weird line went through the, the ocean where one is like, Little murky, muddy, and another is that clear. Mm -hmm. What what's causing that? Where is this? Where where specifically? I, I think it was down around Cape Horn. And, and yeah, I I don't know specifically about that, but it's it's water of different densities, and so you probably had water that started near a coastline, and so it was entraining a lot of um, sediments and mud, and you know, maybe had a lot of biological activity. So you get high foams blooming or something. And then you get water from, you, you folks imagine a well traveled and spent some time in the tropics and those clear, clear, clear waters down there. And um, 
and they're just completely different bodies of water and they just you know they stay distinct for a very long time what's the speed of the deep ocean currents glad you asked so um so when they put this all together they get this thing that looks like a bowl of spaghetti or one of those interstate intersections <laughs> i'm not sure which it is but here you've got their attempt at sort of describing what this is and they call this the thermal Healy circulation so thermal heat healing salt and it's it's circulation deep circulation is driven by density changes differences that are caused by mostly salt and heat and conditions formed at the surface it, uh, just picking a starting point, here we are up here in the North Pacific, or North Atlantic, excuse me, the water dives down, travels down through the Atlantic, like we just looked in the, that layered image I showed you, picks up water from the Atlantic, sort of lays itself on top of that, and then starts sort of being carried by the Antarctic circumpolar current, which as I told you, is very deep. And so it's both surface water and deep water because it's mixing. It's one place where that's happening. And um, carried around, it kind of does a little diversion up into the Indian Ocean, up into the Pacific Ocean, and eventually kind of gets entrained back up. It comes up, a lot of it just kind of drifts up slowly. It's very hard to measure this. So this is happening. It takes about a thousand years for the whole circulation to happen. And so it's very, very slow. It's centimeters per hour. And so you can't really measure it, you know, as most of our tools, if you think about background movement and noise and stuff like that, um, much slower than the surface can. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it's sort of recently discovered, you know, the last 20, 30, 40 years that we looked at and we're starting to be able to kind of put this picture together. Not totally well understood. There's a lot of other things that are happening through here, but but this is kind of the the, the, the knowledge right now of what we think is happening, you know, the way our, our deep oceans and our, our, our shallow oceans you know, connect. So so why do we care? <laughs> other, other than I just think it's so cool. But um, one of the re one of the things that became kind of a truism in um, you see it in textbooks, and you see it, uh, you know, we all sort of know this, that the Gulf Stream, when it delivers all this heat, is delivering heat to Europe, okay? And so Europe and the British Isles were warmer than the um, than other continental areas nearby, and certainly others of the same latitude on the North American continent. And, it, you know, I taught this stuff, and we used to say, yeah, you know, we talk about these little ice ages that happen. There's one during Shakespeare's time that extended uh, for hundreds of years, and some of them turn on and off, and we were talking, and, and it was all attributed to this heat loss up from the Gulf Stream as it heads north and, and east across the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a great story. Here's a picture of Washington with a frozen Delaware River. And here's a picture of the Thames, frozen solid, you know, you've got, um, and it catches our imagination. Um, it turns out it might not be true. <laughs> uh, there's a more sophisticated computer modeling that's now being done on heat transfer across the oceans. And it certainly is losing heat, certainly transferring it in other places, but it may not be a sufficient amount of heat to really cause these changes in climate. Um, another thing that happens that is also not well understood is that the Gulf Stream is variable in its, in its velocity. And so sometimes it goes much slower than other times, and we can measure that, and don't really know why. Um, but um, the speculation has always been, well, what would happen if it just stopped completely? And it would quit diving, and it would quit transferring heat across the ocean, and we would, could potentially see eight to ten degrees centigrade drop in temperature in the in uh, Europe and Northern Europe and parts of the British Isle, um, uh, as opposed to um, that the, that warming that we see. And so I believe what they're thinking is that a lot of that warming is associated with high high level winds, actually. That are happening um, through jet stream level winds that are transferring heat as well. And um, 
Don't ask me any more about that. <laughs> this is stuff you're sort of seeing right now in, in the literature, and I don't understand it all that well. I'm not sure anybody does yet, but 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 certainly the Gulf Stream is involved. And certainly if it cools off or stops sufficiently, there will be much less heat transfer, and that has huge implications across our across our climates. And in a warming climate, maybe that's a good thing because all of a sudden Europe will be cooler. Um, but I, the, most people don't think that's how that will happen. So, um, and it's it's sort of, you know, mysteries of the ocean. <laughs> that's what it's kind of treated. But has anybody heard about the, the business of, the, of warming up the two people? Not, not too many. Okay. Um, you, you get it in a lot of um, high school science books and oceanography, well, uh, sort of introductory to oceanography books. And it's taught as if we really understand it. But it turns out we don't. So I just wanted you guys to know that. <laughs> um, another thing that currents carry, of course, are organisms. And um, plankton being uh, you know, transported to a huge extent by, by the currents. And by plankton, I mean these microscopic plants that live in the surface of the water. Are there forests in the ocean? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100 meters deep, maybe a couple hundred, two, three hundred feet max because they're constrained by gas movement. How about in deep oceans? Wheat fields? None of that, right? <laughs> None of that at all. And so the oceans have a different strategy to their primary production. They don't put a lot of effort into infrastructure, they're not building trees. What they're doing is they're building their, their, all of their primary production, all the plant work, almost all of it, is done by these microscopic organisms. They're kept in the top levels of the water because they need light, and the light isn't perfect. All the light in the ocean is gone by a thousand meters. The ocean itself is profoundly deep and dark, and um, only light is made, light made by the animals themselves down here, but, uh, yeah, and flashes. Uh, so they're constrained by that, and they're out of nutrients often. Um, and so we've got um, uh, a, a need to sort of plant food for them. And the trouble is that these things get disconnected in the oceans. So you've got all the sunlight at the surface, and you've got all the nutrients that have sunk down in dead animals and plants as they die. And so they, they come down, 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 to, um, and drift down into the bottom. And so you've got what you need to grow a good plant disconnected. And so it's um, one of the uh, extremely important ways that this gets, um, gets the, the nutrients get back to the surface is that divergence process I was talking about, where water's moving apart and it's drawing water up from the deep. Okay. Um, and let me show you a picture of how this, might, how this looks. Here's another picture of, of a globe. This time, what we're seeing is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. And so it's the plant pigment that's in terrestrial plants and in aquatic plants. And um, this one has, this is, a, this is an average for the whole year, as it turns out, for 2006. And so you can see the Sahara, not much productivity going on. You can see the Amazon forests and some other places on the land where things are very productive. And so the dark green is very productive. In the oceans, the um, the, we've covered up our scale entirely, but the purple is the least productive, blue is next pr most productive, and it is a, the uh, green more productive still, and then the really hot red, that's the most productive, that's the productivity equivalent to rainforest and things like that. So is it evenly distributed across the globe? What do you think is going on? You have some of the answers already. And and it's in circles, right? It's like, what's this? That's the center of a gyre. Okay. And there's this little purple there is the center of the gyre. Another center of the gyre. And you can see some purple over here in the Pacific also. So the gyre is in the centers of the metallic deserts. Not much going on there at all. And because uh, the water's going down, and it's keeping the um, the nutrients from getting up to the plants. There's a guy that was saying this years and years ago, and they thought it was iron was the um, limiting nutrient. And the famous quote is, give me a barge of iron, and I'll give you a, an ice age, I think is what he was promising. <laughs> you 
one to change the lenses by that. And they tried it, and we didn't do it. <laughs> the iron sinks out too fast because it's, it's being pushed down. But, but it is nutrient depletion in these areas. And areas where we see upwelling along the coasts and here between along the equator and here along that Antarctic circumpolar um, current is where you get high levels of productivity. Who grows down here in the Atlantic, in the, uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current? That's where all that krill is being produced where the whales, the huge whale populations are feeding on just this abundance of stuff. And um, anyway, we've got um, very productive areas, uh, but most of the ocean is, is not very productive at all. And it's determined on whether you've got water coming up from the deep or not. Okay. The, um, I'm gonna run out of time, and so I don't wanna belabor this. You folks have been so nice to sit here. Um, I was going to talk about El Nino, but shall I? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so one of the places that we have a significant impact by the currents and the wind um, is, is the El Nino events, the El Nino um, Southern Oscillation Inso events. And this is um, resulting from large movements of water. This is from across the Pacific, the Southern Pacific Ocean. And um, under normal conditions, here you've got South America, here you've got um, Indonesia and some of the other islands there over here. You've got these trade winds pushing, pushing, pushing water. Um, these are supposed to be high elevation winds. And so this is what's on the surface. And it's pushing the water typically, actually mounding it up um, against the, that far side of this gyre. And, and so it's kind of a butt for water, pushing things down over there. And, where you go from cold to warm, where those layers were just against in the deep water, it tilts. And so you, the, you actually get cold water coming very close to the surface in areas. And that was called um, El Nino, or that was, the, that, that's what drives, excuse me, the, um, the, the anchovy industry, for example, in Peru for years and years. They would count on this nutrient rich water coming up off the coastline. Of South America feeding the zooplankton, which the fish then fed on, and they had this amazing new productive area. Um, and so this is kind of this, the, the um, typical situation. And an El Nino event is when things stall out a little bit. And so, oh, excuse me, here's another image of the typical situation. So here's warm water kind of being pushed into block by the trade winds, by the currents, and here's you know people you know, harvesting <laughs> the, um, and, and it's economically incredibly important. So um, during El Nino, things kind of stall out. And I keep saying this, you know, things stall out. <laughs> but in this case, it also happens. Here it's the trade winds that kind of become unreliable. And so instead of pushing that warm water all the way across the um, Pacific, it kind of stalls part way. And uh, what happens is that you don't get that, that nutrient-rich cold water, that layer, tilting enough, and so it never reaches the surface. And so now you've got downwelling off the coast of Peru, and it, well, we experience it as big storms and changes in the climate, changes, and changes in the weather. Uh, in those areas, they see it as a crash of their fisheries, because they also lose that. So there's all sorts of implications. Um, and um, we're sort of in an El Nino event right now, and it turns out these things last for two, three years. They oscillate between the alternative, which is the El Nino, and then sort of what's normal is kind of the tilting point between them. Um, and so, yeah, the anchovy industry typically has collapsed, simply before we understood what was going on. Um, and, and again, if you can imagine how huge impacts on marine biology across the ocean when this is happening. Um, and, um, and sort of the opposite of that we call it a La Nina, and that's when it um, you get um, it's kind of on the back swing is what's happening, and so you have a um, you have this blob of water. See if it's being pushed. I think I've got a better picture of that. Yeah, trust me on that. The La Nina is, or the El Nino is the one that really is important to us. La Nina brings different. Um, 
storm patterns to to our part of the world and drought conditions and those sorts of things and so it affects things across the continent as well. Um, lastly, I thought I'd talk a little bit about garbage patches, <laughs> something mm -hmm. that because we have um, what's it called the um, one gets up later that's not really a wash of shore thank you um, and wonderful sort of outreach programs like this that demonstrate plastics in our ocean. It's been a lot in the news lately because we're discovering how much how much plastic is in our oceans and how it never goes away. Well, it doesn't just kind of accumulate. It accumulates in a, in a, in a predictable pattern in our oceans. And now that we know about gyres and you know about downwelling, you can imagine where you'd see it. You're going to see it in these areas where I've been talking about the water has been mounded up a little bit, not productive at all, right? These are the purple areas in this gyre. This would be the North Pacific gyre, uh, but it's plastic, so it floats, right? And so we've got um, a lot of our plastics come from land, and a lot of it brings also off of container ships and things like that. We are just, we've been just terrible ocean citizens, you know, just throwing things into the ocean as if we can just do this forever. And and so they get caught up in these gyres and eventually sort of cycle into these areas of convergence in the center of our gyres. And it's not really, you can't walk across the plastic out there. There's a lot of plastic. And eventually it breaks down to small enough particles that it starts to actually sink down too. And then these tiny little particles get into the food chain eating the, the um, plastic nets, getting trained by organisms at the surface. It's a huge issue, as I'm sure you all know, and, um, and exacerbated to a large extent by the currents themselves focusing this. Um, so we have... Um, a lot of, you know, you've seen these sorts of things. The, the way we're going to fix this one, folks, is simply getting plastic out of the ocean and going out there with the harvesters, it, it, it's a feel good thing, the exercise. They, they can't really remove that much plastic. There's thousands of them. There's so much plastic in the oceans anymore. So we're going to have to stop the source of it and then let it sort of work its way through. But I, I just put that up there as sort of a little PR thing. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just a tiny little sampling. And, um, and you know, maybe it'll whet your, you know, enthusiasm to look into it a little bit more. But we do have a lot of energy uh, with our waves, just moving waves, you know, and, um, the moving energy and then transferring that to objects, mostly along the edges of our, our, our oceans or objects that are floating in the ocean. And then we have currents that are actually moving bodies of water, masses of water in this huge thousand year circulation that goes from the surface down to the deep water and covers all of our oceans because it's all one ocean across the Mexic. Um, causes, transports heat, transports chemicals and nutrients, transports organisms, transports trash, and um, causes both predictable changes, but also some unpredictable changes. And I threw in this thing about climate here at the end because the temperature differences that we're seeing are not very significant. They're not huge in the oceans. And yet it's enough to really change the density of the water and change the properties of these currents. And so if we're talking about raising temperatures in our oceans by just a few degrees centigrade from the tipping point, it can have huge implications on how these currents set up and how they move. Um, with climate scientists, especially, they tend to work with long data sets of the past, and they use those as a predictor of the future. We know, okay, conditions are basically the same. We're going to follow that. But right now, we're in a, in a situation where the past is no longer a good predictor of the future. I'm sure you've heard people say that. And this is one of the reasons. And so we're sort of in a brave new world here, trying to use models and other ways of figuring out and our understanding of these properties of water and understanding what the implications would be for things like health currents. Um, and with that little apostrophizing, that's all I was going to say. This has been a very attentive, thank you. I've been over my time. Shall I answer a couple of questions? Oh, I have two hours. Oh, well. I'll take some questions if you have any.
Yes, I, I'm sure you said this and I missed it. It'll fly by. 